It is often assumed that breathing occurs naturally, but many people are unaware that they breathe inappropriately and that it is affecting their health. A good breathing pattern is one where, at rest, we breathe effortlessly, preferably through our nose and using mainly the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles to breathe in and elastic recall to breathe out. With effort, resulting in an increased requirement for oxygen, we may need to recruit the accessory muscles of respiration. The scalene, sternocleidomastoid and pectoralis minor muscles to breathe in and the internal intercostal and abdominal muscles to breathe out. Following exertion, a good breathing pattern will revert to turning off the accessory muscles of respiration, allowing the diaphragm to function efficiently. Due to muscle memory, our body can adopt inappropriate, poor muscle patterns in response to stress, poor posture, hyperventilation or a chronic cough, resulting in the overuse of the accessory muscles of respiration. Using these muscles takes more effort and consequently more oxygen than breathing efficiently. The accessory muscles encourage breathing into the upper part of the chest, leading to muscle tension, which may cause neck and back pain and other systemic symptoms. It is common for people with a respiratory condition to breathe in the upper part of their chest. This inhibits airway clearance and may unnecessarily increase the work of breathing. Observing a full inspiration and expiration will assist in determining if breathing dysfunction may be contributing to sputum retention as a deep breath is likely to cause a cough if sputum is present. If breathing training causes the patient to cough, address sputum clearance before continuing with breathing training. A thorough assessment of the breathing pattern, rate and symptoms is required to ascertain if breathing retraining is warranted. This will include observation of breathing at rest, noting if they have tension in the jaw, neck and shoulders, if their shoulders and or chest rise during inspiration and if they are a mouth or nose breather. Nose breathing is preferable as it humidifies and filters the inspired air. It may be necessary to take their pulse to make watching their breathing pattern less obvious. Movement of the thoracic cage can be felt by placing your hands on the lower, middle and upper parts of the chest, at the same time observing breath holds and respiratory rate. Inflation of the chest can be assessed by measuring the sternocostal angle at rest. A hyperinflated chest, which increases the work of breathing, will have an obtuse angle which, if reversible, should become increasingly acute following treatment and the reduction of residual volume within the lungs. To teach breathing retraining, the patient should ideally be in supine or side-lying. Make sure that the patient is comfortable and fully supported with several pillows under the knees and one or two pillows under the head. Some patients may need to have their knees fully bent up to assist with relaxation of the diaphragm. Side lying may be required for obese or pregnant patients as this allows the abdominal contents to fall away from the diaphragm. The arms can either be placed behind their head, on their abdomen or resting on the bed. It is a good idea to use a pulse oximeter during breathing retraining as patients will frequently report that they feel short of breath and need to take a deep breath to get more oxygen. An oxygen saturation reading provides feedback for their training. On most occasions, patients will have their normal reading even though they may feel short of breath. Once they are comfortable, guide them through progressive relaxation of the body. This will assist in turning off the accessory muscles of respiration and enhance the function of the diaphragm. During this phase, ask the patient to focus on breathing out, imagining all the tension flowing out of their body with each outward breath. With the patient relaxed, observe the breathing pattern. If the diaphragm is not adequately moving, a wheat bag can be placed on the abdomen for proprioception. If the patient still has upper chest movement, with their permission, stand in front of or behind them and place your hands on their upper chest, pressing down firmly to inhibit movement of the upper chest. Initially, only talk to the patient about the breath out, not the breath in, 
as this should occur naturally once the accessory muscles of inspiration are inhibited. If dynamic hyperinflation is an issue, focus on a prolonged expiration with an end expiratory pause before inspiration. Manually squeezing out the air may also be necessary for some people. With their permission, place your hands on either side of their mid rib cage and squeeze out the air at the end of expiration. This will not be possible for patients with chronic shortness of breath. After the breathing training session, the patient is prescribed a daily home program, which should include two 10 minute breathing training sessions in supine or side lying every day. To provide repetitive feedback, patients should also be instructed to stop, relax, and focus on five training breaths hourly throughout the day. Once an appropriate breathing pattern has been achieved in supine, the patient should progress to practicing their breathing routine in sitting standing, and finally, after exercise. It should be explained to them that returning to an appropriate breathing pattern will only occur with constant practice and may take several months.